You're listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience, a podcast dedicated to helping executives train their sales and marketing teams to optimize growth. Whether you're looking for techniques and strategies or tools and resources, you've come to the right place. Let's accelerate your growth in three, two, one. Welcome everyone to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. I'm your co-host, Carlos Noche, and I'm joined by my amazing podcast partner, Lisa Schneer. How are we doing today, Lisa? Doing okay, Carlos. It's been a busy week, but uh, happy that it's Friday and excited to be here with Kate. Awesome. All right. Uh, Some of you might have noticed that we're releasing these podcasts weekly. We would love your feedback. Each week, we try to find an interesting guest, an amazing topic, and our goal is to just uncover some insights within our conversation that are helpful to you. And speaking of which, today we're discussing sales competency. How do we develop and more importantly measure what good looks like? And I'm really interested in understanding how organizations or how we enable organizations to better measure the success of their internal programs and external programs. Yeah, and for this very important topic today, because we talk to people, Carlos and I, as you all know, are in this business. We train people all the time, and measurement is something that a lot of companies struggle with. So I'm really excited to have with us Kate Lewis, CEO and co-founder of e for enable which is a platform that actually helps sales enablers to identify and close the gaps in their sales teams and to measure the true impact. So Kate, thank you so much for taking the time today. We know how much how valuable your time is and we really appreciate it. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. I don't feel the pressure at all now that you've said you invite interesting guests on. I just got this big like capital letters B interesting. So, you know, that's the number one, on. number one thing I need to be today. Don't, <laughs> interesting. Don't let us down. Honestly, you are interesting just by researching you. So yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You're making me feel better already. <laughs> well, here, to start, uh, a little off-the-cuff question that Kate, that we like to ask everyone. What's something that you're passionate about that those that only know you through work or business might be surprised to know about you? That's always a question that makes me think and also makes me realize that I'm not that interesting. But... <laughs> There are probably two things. Well, there's lots of things. I mean, I'm, I'm going to leave the fact that I'm passionate about my family and my children. I think that's a given. I'm really passionate about gardening. Gardening for me is my escape, my stress relief, my bringing order and making mistakes and doing it all on my own and not having anybody else judging along the way. It's my peace place. So yeah, I'm really passionate about, uh, about gardening, which isn't that rock and roll. I know. I'm sure I've got some other rock and roll stuff. But, but there's some there's something about, well, there's something about getting your hands in the dirt. Something just joyous. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Love it. Yeah. Love it. And yeah, I'm not a very good gardener. But even just I, I did this last well, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago. I did the first round of uh raking the leaves in my backyard. <laughs> that's, been, that's advanced stuff, that is. <laughs> right. <laughs> but honestly, like I I just it's such a immediate feeling of accomplishment yeah yeah it allows you to just be present and be accomplished and say you don't have to be good at it you just have to get your hands dirty which that's it yeah Yeah. and when you plant like a a lovely garden you can walk away and be like i just planted this and it's 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 like gratification instant gratification yes yes (laughs) it's just too (laughs) it's too early (laughs) <laughs> it is, for us, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so can you uh, tell us a little bit about your story? Like, how did you end up here in your career? Like being CEO, co-founder of e for enable How? What led you to this? Well, I had the problem, right? So I'm a qualified spin trainer. I've done transformations throughout my career in, and not just spin, but other otherwise. So I've always been a sales leader, first and foremost, but then always chosen to lead a transformation and, and implement new methodologies, new training um, sort of within every organization I've been in. And I love training people and I love being involved in that. And I think it's hugely valuable and I get really passionate about it. And then I just get really disappointed. And I just experienced it too many times of delivering great training, even if I pat myself on the back, great training, you know, getting those lovely feedback forms that say, I love the trainer, the the training was really valuable. And then going and like recording some stuff to help the sales leaders follow up on it. Um, 
and that, you know, everybody walks out high-fiving and then they're like the Tuesday after. It's like a tumbleweed moment. It's like nobody does anything with it. And the sales leaders are just back to their forecast, deal review, forecast, getting involved in deal negotiation, legal, like the day job, job pressure. And they're just, just always, I was just really frustrated. They always felt like there was a huge disconnect between how sales were driven were managed, were performance checked, and what sales training was designed to do and did do. And they just, just like, there was just a gap in the middle. And as, as somebody that had a foot in both camps, I wanted to solve that problem. I wanted to see what should we be training to in the first place? Who should we be training on that? Why? What's in it for them? What is it going to impact? What are we going to be expecting to see on the green shoots to start seeing the early uh, impact of that? What are we ultimately expecting to deliver? And should we be doing it again or should we double down or change something? And I just needed to solve that problem. Couldn't find it. Bottle of wine on a Friday night, true story, uh, was venting massively and A for Enable was born. Wow. Bottle of wine was definitely part of it. <laughs> 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 that's that's how I came up for the with the name for my company actually. But we like Carlos. I don't know about you, but I very much relate to everything you just said. The frustration of not knowing. We try our best. We spend so much time chasing our clients. Sorry, clients, we love you, but you're very bad <laughs> at measuring the success of what you're doing. It's that immediacy. It's a pressure that sales like comes with, and that one when one thing's over, it's just right. Got to get on to the next thing, and that and and the pressure just rains down. Especially if you've taken time out, you know, for, for, for the training. It's just. I've now got to get, I've got to play catch up. I've got to do all the things. All the pressures just keep on me. And so it's easy to forget to do the follow up, especially if the connection between and say what's in it for me individually, what's in it for my team hasn't been made. Um, I think that's a real challenge. I've been through 11 different programs and I can tell you, I got something out of each one of them. Mm. I've even been through spin. A lot of them, and this is not specific to spin, is, hey, this conceptually is wonderful. Like, you yes. know, the complex sale conceptually was great. Too freaking complex. There's no way I'm going to do this every day. And yeah. so the program itself needs to be simple enough to make it part of your daily DNA to actually catch on. And then the other piece of it is you got to get management to inspect with the aspect. So one of my new lines is, folks, I got good news, bad news. You own all the work to make this happen. You also own all the success. Yeah. And But getting tools behind it to help would be great. Let me take a step back because our audience is a lot smarter than I am. So I always like the level set. When we say the word sales competency for a guy where English is a second language, help our listeners out. What does that mean? Okay, let's start there. And then we can dive into like how we measure on the other side of it. I think for me, I probably use it as a broader term around the ability to implement and use the skills, the knowledge, the behaviors that you've learned. So for me, being competent at something is being able to translate theory into practice and be able to do that consistently. And again, to, to broaden the horizon and, and not get picky about it. Competency, is it can be knowledge, it can be skills, it can be mindset traits, it, it can be the things that go up, the ingredients that go up into making the perfect cake, right? It's, it's or sales cake, should I say. It, it's what good looks like. It's the attributes of what good looks like for each role in an organization and specific to each organization, by the way. It's really interesting that you say that because is there like a lot of people ask us and I've been mentoring young people coming up in their careers. Like I worked with SDR teams, you know, my whole career. And a lot of the time they'll ask like, are, am I cut out for sales? So mm -hmm. when you say there's a lot of traits or behaviors, like, do you, do you feel like there are times that it can't be taught or that uh, does it tie back to the mindset thing? I'm, I'm just, you know, really curious about all the things you just said. Yeah, I think mindset well, traits are often considered things that are inherent to an individual. Yeah. And I partly agree. What, what I, and the reason I say partly agree is that self being self-aware and about your own inherent capabilities or your own mindset trait is something that needs calling out because it impacts your ability to apply and consistently apply the other elements of skills and behaviors and, and, and knowledge, right? 
Let me give you an example. I might be a slightly negative person. I'm not, by the way. I'm, t- I'm probably too positive. It's one of my terrible traits. But let's say positivity and being resilient in sales is something that's really important, right? To be able to be successful, you have to have a positive mindset. You need to be resilient. If that's something you're not, then you can compensate in other areas, but only if you realize that that's the thing that's holding you back and inherently causing you not to be able to be great at other things. Painting a picture of what good looks like doesn't mean you're brilliant at everything. It is not a a cookie cutter approach by any means. I think that's dangerous to say that we should create complete homogeneity across every single person um, within a sales team. What it does allow you to do is say, Where do I need to compensate? What's working well for me? I can double down on that. What isn't, do I need to be self-aware about it? So if I'm aware that I'm a naturally negative person and I'm then aware that that might have impact of people around me and it might cause me to think about the worst case scenario all the time or not take on new ideas, then I can compensate for that and do something about it. So it might not change the trait in me because that's inherent, but it allows me to compensate for it. And I think that's where mindset, that whole, nature versus nurture argument comes into it. But so it has to come with self-awareness. It can be kind of an awkward or uncomfortable conversation to have with someone, right? Like that to inform them that they need to be more self-aware. Well, I'll give you an example, Kate. One of the things that I did when I was running teams was actually say to people who underperformed for a length of time, after multiple coaching sessions, training sessions, and I would just say, how do you think I think things are going? And once I positioned it that way, it was like the walls came down and they went, yeah, I know. You know, like, and then I would say, I don't want you to come to work on Monday dreading this job. Do you really think this is the path you want to take? So I would try to guide them down that self-awareness path of, you know, I know this is not what I really want to be doing. Particularly, you think about SDRs and cold calling and, you know, there's a lot of yeah. anxiety and rejection. <laughs> yeah. I guess it applies to sales, too, if you're a salesperson who does any prospecting. But yeah, I, I think, you know, that self-awareness piece and that conversation can be really hard to have. You're absolutely right, particularly if you're a first-time manager, or you, you know, you're not as an experienced manager, but, you know, the tool of having a competency framework where that is called out in it, that you've got the right blend. These are the mindset traits. These are the skill set traits. These are the knowledge traits. These are the process or behavior traits. Those, having that painted really clearly allows you a safe place to have those conversations because you're both then being able to call out and say, let's look at this map of what good looks like and let's look at where we are against each of these things. And there's the the ability to A, have a self-realization that that's not, you know, that's what's holding you back, but B, have a a conversation with somebody that's underpinned by, you know, the right map. And that is quite powerful rather than leaving somebody to find that out on their own. You know, I'm a big advocate. I was having a conversation with somebody um, earlier today. I'm a big advocate of the GROW coaching methodology, right? Just generally as a, a very broad framework, but that's the problem in sales. It's a very broad framework and the options and reality bit in GROW are hard because you're not, you can't be like, I'm just going to let this be completely open and find your own way. No, no, there's a reality of where you are on your numbers and where, where we know you are. And the options aren't, there is a certain predetermined aspect of the options that I think we can go through to be, to, to change that. And, you know, again, a competency framework, using that as the lens through which to say, what's the reality and what options have we got is again, just super supportive to having those conversations rather than it just being too too broad and too wide. So this is a off the cuff question, I'll be honest, because I get asked about this a lot. Even with the competency framework, how long do you let somebody not be competent? Um, you know, like I get asked this all the time by managers who are concerned about how well they feel guilty about like how quickly they might say this is not the right fit. God, that is a really good off the cuff question there, Lisa. I, and I'm going to give a political answer here, and that depends on the fair, organization. Totally fair. On I know role. it's a hard question. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, that's where I think results and competence, you know, come together. Because again, you can have somebody who's super positive and super amazing and super, you know, chipper in an SDR role, but just doesn't get it. And no matter how many times they're trained, no matter how many times they're coached, they just don't get it. If they're still driving results, yeah, if they're still able to get there because they're, you know, they're compensating and they've got other skill sets that they can bring to bear, then great. If they're not, then you've normally got a fairly 
clear time frame through which you can do it, but that will differ by role. You know, if you're in enterprise sales, that's going to take longer to right. understand the relationship and impact between their competence and their ability to deliver on the things that are required to deliver in sales. Ultimately, we're all beholden to a revenue number and a performance number, and we need to be able to demonstrate that you know, to a certain extent, and this is not always the case, the only time I'm really peeling back the layers is when when I'm not performing, right? So the, the relationship between the two are, you know, are really close. And, but we've just got to be clear about those lines of connection. If I'm not performing here. What are the competencies that underpin that? Where are you on those competencies? If we've tried and tried and, and, and failed and it's still not having an impact on the number, then we need to have that conversation which says, this isn't working. We've given so much support and it still isn't changing the outcome. So political answer without a time frame, yes. But. That's good. I know that you guys are, are, are a platform for measuring this ultimately, but you mentioned having a competency map. Do you help <laughs> your clients define that? Yeah, absolutely. I'd say, and, and my percentage here isn't an accurate percentage, so it differs sometimes when I talk about it. But right now I'm feeling there's about a 75% overlap in most organizations' competencies, right? We know that you've got to do great discovery. We know stakeholder engagement. We know negotiation, objection handling, all of those are your standard one. But the rest and some of the specificity that sit within those is determined by what the organizational goal is. So we walk through a process of walking backwards. What is it that I like a visualization exercise, right? So I'll say, okay, you're 12 months from now or 18 months from now, you're standing in a board meeting and you're presenting to the board and you've nailed it. Like, you know it. You're standing at that. I mean, you've got a little bit of a bounce in your step. You're feeling pretty good about yourself. What are, what are the four, three or four things that are on that first slide that you say, nailed it, nailed it, nailed it, nailed it. What do they say? Right. Okay. There, we've just gained, you know, an extra 50% of of FTSE 500 logos. We've grown our, our pipeline by 500%. We've grown our revenues this year by 120%. We've done it all from within our existing you know, sales team. Okay, right. So let's just be really clear on the measure of those, right? Brilliant. That's 18 months away, two years away, however far away we're, we're working in terms of your, you know, your strategic goal application. So let's walk backwards through all of the leading indicators to the earliest ones we can get. Like in a quarter's time from now, what are the early glimmers, the green shoots that you're going to start thinking, oh, that, that feels good, right? That's going to be, that's going to be things like we're, you know, we're generating pipeline in more FTSE 500 accounts. Where, how do you generate pipeline? Right, well, we're having more meetings. So we're walking backwards still, more meetings in this. Right, okay, so we're having more stakeholder conversations in those types of accounts, right? Have fly on the wall. You're a sales leader or an enablement leader. You're in a meeting and you walk out of that meeting with one of your reps and you go, I guarantee that's an op. And I swear it's going to be like a killer one. It's going to close. What were you observing? You were a fly on the wall. What did they do? What were the things they said, did, or otherwise in that meeting that made you feel damn confident that it was going to be a great outcome, right? Well, they had the right people in the room. Okay, right. So that's right. So we now start to understand that that's the beginnings of a competency that are going to underpin your ability to get to that goal of getting to more FTSE 500 logos on your book, right? So they had, they were engaging at sea level. Okay, so we now need to know we, we can have that engaging conversation. They only positioned the right solution to the, to the challenge of that organization, great. They've done the right research, so they, they didn't spend their time doing unnecessary discovery, right? Okay. So we've now got four or five competencies that we know are going to underpin, A, to get them to the right people to the right meeting, to make sure the content of that meeting is really good and that the outcome of that is X. There's going to be other things along the way, but now we understand the early things that are going to influence that. And that, for me, is the beginnings of, of creating a very specific applicable framework for each organization that makes sense to them and they can consume. And the other thing I'll say before is, that is language really matters. So, you know, don't get caught up in your jargon. We use problem, like I use problem discovery all the time. But if you're going into, you know, I don't know, an old school manufacturing organization and you're trying to affect change and you start talking about problem discovery, they're like, what, you know, change it to asking great questions, change it to really understand your customer, something. But yeah, you know, don't get caught up on that, but language does matter. Sometimes like even for like organizations that sell a lot of services, I got to go, hey, let's try to understand their current state and then what their future state is. Yeah. And that kind of was like, hey, these are the problems I got today. And this is the solutions or outcomes or, you know, that I want tomorrow. So let's talk about measuring success. So both Lisa and I, you know, we run these programs and we're big believers of you know, starting with the end in mind. What are those outcomes, kind of like your visualization exercise that you're looking for? And then measuring against those along the way. So help us understand how 
you know, what's your perspective on measuring success and how do you truly do that in a way that you can prove that, hey, we, we did move the needle on this or that? You're not going to see what I'm drawing, but I'm a visual person. That's how I look. So I'm, I'm literally going to be drawing. So if you see me looking down here, it's not notes I'm drawing. So me, that's where your competency framework becomes the translation mechanism. It's the babel fish of enablement, if you like, in terms of how you translate everything through that lens. Results are connected to competence, right? So we've just established that we've got a set of results that are going to be impacted by the skills and behaviors you're able to apply to that. Yes, we, we're in agreement with that. When you start a training exercise there should be clarity on what competency we're designing uh, to influence, right? Are we are getting people to ask better questions? So what we're not doing is implementing a training session that's saying we're going to influence pipeline growth in FTSE 500 account. That's crazy. What we are saying is the whole point of this training exercise is to influence and improve this particular competency. But we've already done the mapping exercise that helps us understand what that competency is going to impact. Now, by translating it through that framework, it creates a clear pathway that everybody can look at it on with their lens, but the same truth. Yeah. So measurement becomes clearer because we're translating it through that, that lens. Now, to do that, we need a before and after. So we need to be really clear on where everybody is on that competency before we start. So that's through what, where are they against the positive behaviors that underpin each of those com competencies. We do an assessment. We understand where they are. We apply data to that. So we align a level of objectivity to, to smooth out the subjective wrinkles. We know where would they are on the results that relate to that competency. Now we're able to measure the correlation. Now I am going to say correlation, not causation here, but the correlation between when we began that training program or enablement initiative and the change in behavior and the change in results that ensued as a result of that. Well, I, I just wanted to double tap on this a little bit to kind of... So let's say the competency is to ask better questions, right? To yeah. uncover better data, to qualify and progress the deal. And the outcome is going to be, hey, we're going to win, improve our win rate, right? How do you measure that we're asking better questions? Like, how do we know what better looks like? That is a great question. So again, it's about defining, it's about being really clear about defining what good looks like, right? So just describing a competency isn't good enough. You need to describe the positive behaviors in as specific terms as you can, and then find the ways now, uh, I know uh, what you're going to say about this, then find the ways that you can measure. So you've got a conversational intelligence tool. If you have, you've got ways to uh, apply trackers to that that align to specific behaviors and specific questions and subjects. Ultimately, you've got observation. So you've got your manager observing or somebody observing if they have the time or, or bandwidth to do that. But the other elements that you can do is, is apply data points, right? So ultimately, you've talked about that later down the line, more lagging indicator, right? That we're designed to, to drive more pipeline or drive closed revenue. That's what we want to do. That's what how we should be measuring our training programs, right? Did we get more bang for our buck? But that's quite laggy, right? That's far too far down the line. So let's see what the early things that asking great questions are going to do. Is this simply, you know, do you measure positive outcomes from meetings? Do you measure the type of opportunity that somebody's got? Do you measure the stakeholders that they've gotten in the room at that point? And so it's just being specific about the measures that you're designing, you know, that you want to influence and then the lag time between that influence so that you can apply that to your correlation as well. But yeah, the earlier indicator you can possibly get, whether it's, say, it's a result of a gone call or it's, a, you know, the things that somebody mentioned, whether it's the meeting outcomes that you're tracking, whether it's the type of people you're speaking to uh, and getting on those meetings, then, then those are the early indicators. And then it might be that different skills are applied to move that, that further down the funnel. And that would be a different training program that moves it further down the funnel, for example. So one of the things that we found, so like I, we're with, with you, right? Looking at lagging and leading indicators. And those leading indicators are usually their behaviors on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So yep. one leading indicator, and I'm just sharing this, you, you, you can agree, disagree, but with, also with our audience is, you know, you're asking all these great questions to uncover information. If your goal is just to uncover it because your manager asks you to fill out a form or a field in Salesforce, there is little motivation to do that. But yep. if your goal is to capture it for the buyer, throughout the sales cycle, we represent that in a mutual success plan, whether it be within an email or a presentation. So we can yep. measure, hey, which one of our accounts have a mutual success plan or not? And, and then the managers can literally look at these and coach folks and go, hey, that's good, that's bad, this could be better, right? But at least it's, it's something that's a lot more measurable. And then we can even track, hey, 
accounts where we do have a mutual success plan, do we win those more or do we win those less? Do we win yeah. them at a uh, at a higher ACV or a lower ACV? And in our research, it's obviously been a huge impact because that's how we get paid. But one mm -hmm. of the things we brought, but to, it's not just you know a system that does it for you. It, it, you really got to look at the quality behind it too. That's a second step. Like, are they doing it one? And then what's the quality of it? And in quality, yes, guying and other tools can help. The managers need to roll up their sleeves and really look at it. You mentioned it, right? Mm -hmm. are, are we listening into their calls? Are we looking at their mutual success plans and going, hey, th this is good, but this would make it better. What, yeah. what are your thoughts on that? I absolutely think if you've got a way of saying we're, we're doing that, we, we integrate with a lot of enablement platforms that are sending kind of video summaries and things like that. So it's looking at if you, you know, are you getting more success when you're sending your video summary? But it's not just, you know, I, I want to be clear, measurement isn't just about applying and being able to raise your banner and say, I've got five stars, isn't it great? Our training is wonderful and our enablement team is super duper. I'm more interested when I'm looking at the anomalies, the gaps that remain, the things that aren't working, because that's where you can have your biggest influence and your biggest gain. And that's why I think continual measurement and going into that measurement without a, I want to make it look like this is really important. So you're absolutely right. Where you've got a team and you're like, look, I can see a correlation between the people who send out more of those uh, summaries um, or those success plans rather, and their average win rate. They win more when they do that or they're their time to win is much lower, you know, it's much shorter when they do that. That's great. And I'm ticking the box and I'm feeling good and warm and fuzzy about myself, but I'm now going to be looking at the ones that are not because A, I can now prove that there's a what's in it for me, an absolute provable what's in it for me to articulate to those that are not. And B, it's a huge coaching opportunity for me to up the bar. Now, the ones that are really not doing it goes back to our conversation earlier, Lisa, which is, I mean, if you're just not into this and you just, you know, you've got a, a rubbish average deal cycle, you're not even into doing that. Why are you even in sales? Let's be fair. You're not clearly not wanting to win. But the ones that are nearly there, that's just such a coaching opportunity. You deliver a social selling program. And it hasn't quite had the impact that you wanted to on the social selling index or their in-mail acceptance rate. I'm not going, oh God, that's awful. I'm going, what do I need to change? What do I now need to do to change it up? Is it that we've not got the right manager engagement? Is it the fact that my, my training or my course that I, I did myself hasn't quite hit the mark? Is it the fact that they still don't understand something? You know, that opportunity to continually iterate and continually go where the challenge is is the whole point to a certain degree of measurement. Measurement is not just to prove impact. It's about saying, where do I need to be in the first place to influence impact is the big piece for me. Agrees. <laughs> Very much so. And I'm sure, and Carlos does too. I can see it in his eyes. Um, but like, okay, I want to say this like diplomatically, but <laughs> a lot of le leadership teams don't hold people accountable to the things that we need them to inspect in order to <laughs> reinforce the behaviors that are surfaced by a platform like eFernable. You know, like if you've got the rubric, now it's telling you exactly what you need to do, but then they need to execute on that. And so do you also include like a manager assessment, manager training, manager reinforcement? Like, because that has been huge for us. Yeah. Is like if the if the leadership teams, I say manager, but like leadership all the way down from the very top, if they are not bought in, we don't see it get adopted, not for any very long length of time, you know? I couldn't agree with you more. I wrote a blog two years ago. I just probably on our website. People always ask us what the secret source is for a successful coaching program or competency-based coaching program. And they're loads. You know, get your competency framework right. Get, get your measures right. Make sure this is happening. Do you know the number one weak point, actually, in all of it is the CRO. I'm sorry <laughs> to all the CROs out there. I hear that, CROs. Because what happens is everybody gets excited again, right? Oh, yeah. we well, like The thing that's going to solve our problem next year is going and spending loads. You know, We're going to SKO. We're going to retrain everybody. We're going to do this. We're in a new sales methodology. We're doing it all. And then again, two weeks later, the CRO is not doing any of the behaviors around coaching with his first line, his first line down. Now, what does that say to his first reports? It says that that's not important, that what's important is the forecast. And we know the forecast is important. I get it. But the, all that's important is where's that deal and where are we with our forecast? Then 
immediately that's what they will cascade down, right? And so that you'll still get pockets of really good ones that'll go, no, I was really keen with that coaching and I want to keep doing it and I love it. Like you'll get the SDR leader maybe still winning. But if a CRO doesn't exhibit the behaviors that he wants his managers to, that are going to embed and get the ROI from all of his initiatives, then the wheels are going to fall off. They're the linchpin of everything. They, you know, and all of the managers are. They can either be a blocker or a superpower and manager enablement, dare I say it, the CRO enablement. Yeah. Like, right, is is so important because we are the, you know, the result of our our learnings and our experiences. If I've never been coached by my manager, how does that reflect on how I coach my team or how I manage my team is the culmination of the experience of how I've been managed predominantly. So yeah, couldn't agree more. So Kate, along those same lines, we're in full agreement because I'm, I'm just picturing in my head how many times I've seen them say one thing at the training. And then when I talk to them a week, two weeks, three weeks, I've literally had a, a, a manager at a 30-day checkpoint say, Carl, if I'm honest with you, I haven't thought about this for the last 30 days. And it's like, hey, I really appreciate the honesty. You know, are, when you look at your results, is it a fault of your people or is it a fault of yourself? Yeah. No. I, if you don't find it's important, why in the world do you think they would? And again, it just goes back to it. It just bleeds throughout the organization when that happens. No, I was just kind of pivoting when we're, we're thinking about these programs. And this is a very selfish question. How important is it who delivers the training, the competency training? You know, because uh, you're measuring this stuff. So, and again, I, I freely say I'm being selfish. You know, does in-house versus outside vendor matter? I'm not sure I necessarily have an answer to that. I think it's what's right for the purpose of the organization. If nobody in that organization is enabled enough and skilled enough to be able to deliver that, then you've got a problem. I mean, in the first instance, because the first place I'd be doing is enabling and, and training the managers on that anyway. But in terms of, so in my experience, I was one of those trained trainers, right? I was a sales leader in a large organization. I was then applied. I, I was trained as a trainer. I then deployed that training. The benefit of that is that I can make it really specific. I can talk about my personal experiences of being able to say, when I sold that deal to Ericsson, I did these things and now, oh my yep. God, it did this. And I, I was able to achieve why. On the flip side of that, it also means I've got a day job to do and I've got other things that I need to do and I'm not wholly responsible for everything and, and I'm not accountable to all the people I've trained. And I don't have all of the other things in the background that, that I have. So I don't have a definitive answer on that. I think it's what's right for each organization and it's what's right, again, think about gap selling, right? Anything around that, I'm selling to the gap. That's what I'm selling to. And enablement is no different. And training is no different. We're applying it to the gap. And what fits the gap, the solution that fits the gap is the right solution as long as it's then measurable and accountable. Then, then that's what matters more than anything. Hey, Ken, I, I see that. It, you're right. It kind of depends on what competency or what we're training. But in sales and business development and these things, here's my guilty opinion. Having someone that has never, like in your example, you carried a bag. You closed yeah. a large account. Yeah. Uh, having someone that has never done that try to tell you how to do it, especially for salespeople, is a foolish error. Oh, get, yeah, that lacks credibility. Right uh, then you get the folks that are like, yeah, I closed deals 20 years ago. And I go, <laughs> you do realize that the challenges from 10 to 20 years ago are very different than the challenges today. And the other thing I think we forget like that is how hard sales is. Yeah. And how many uncontrollable moving parts we have. So again, I'm biased, but having someone, so all, all of our people are hundred percent quoted carrying reps. We eat what we kill. We're yep. not full-time facilitators. And the reason for that is because if you're not actively prospecting, closing business, running mm -hmm. accounts, you quickly forget it. And that's why when we do these competency trainings around sales, we get immediate feedback. We do tailor it to the customer in their environment. So it's not cookie cutter, but it's those stories that we have, you know, behind the account that keeps us sharp, which I think a lot of internal groups suck at. I think the fundamental thing that you talked about is that ability to bring your experience to bear. And I think unless you're training something that is literally just 
you know, process methodology, which is do this and do that, then do that. I'm training you how to do something. Fine. If it's something that needs context and it needs experience and it needs a bit of a war story and a bit of a bruising along the journey to really add impact, then not having any of that really rocks credibility. Um, and I think it differs from a training facilitator to a true trainer, isn't it? That's that's the difference. I can get everybody in a room and I can deliver a slide deck, but am I able to deliver that with with power? But again, I think, you know, there are certain instances for certain organizations. I don't want everybody to walk away from this saying, well, I can't I can't afford to get external trainers in and therefore I shouldn't be doing any training. You know, you do what you can do for the gap that you've got for the resources that you have. But yeah, I, Carlos, I do agree with you. Having those war stories, having that experience is phenomenal to power up those that the, the impact that you know have. I'm thinking about what you're talking about, Kate, as if layering in with what we do, because I just, you know, you can tell when you're in a room full of people and you're training them if they're bought in or not. And you can yeah. tell who's bought in. Like we can tell, uh, I'm sure you can too, like you can point to the people that you can tell are not bought in. And you just think the last thing I want to do here is walk away from this training session and have them say, I mean, it was nice, but it's not worthwhile. So what you're doing at e for enable adds this layer where we talk about it, as Carlos mentioned, like we leave every session trying to set up a 30-day action plan, 30, 60, 90-day action plan. It's not always successful because, of course, you need the commitment from the client. But what you're talking about, what you've built is going to sit on top of that and say, okay, you invested in this training. This is how we're going to measure it based on a rubric that's built for you, Mm -hmm. not one that's like just generic. I love that. And then let's measure this over the next, you know, year, two years, whatever. Because we know as well that the reinforcement of this is like the training is just just the beginning. You're hardly yeah. scratching the surface oh, at yeah. that point. Yeah. The reinforcement part is when the relationship starts to like, you know, we're going to be partners for a year, two years, three years, uh, up to five, 10 years. Like we've, we've had clients we've worked with for eight to 10 years. Yeah. So being able to report back on those things and use a rubric to say, these people adopted it. These people didn't. These were a fit. These weren't like that's so incredibly valuable. And it's something that we talk about so often and we chase people about. So really excited about what you're doing. Um, And I just think that mm, the management piece comes in there is like, I hate to say it, folks, audience, definitely evaluate your management as far as like how much they're bought in to what you're Mm -hmm. doing. Because if they're not, I don't care if they say, well, my team hits their number, so I'm not going to hold them to something new. Yeah, not bought in. Do you know, do you know the funny thing is when you talk about the, the kind of rubric, the measures, the things that you've been able to see, the layers, the nice thing about doing it where you've got that clarity, you've got your competency framework, you know where everybody is, is that you get to slice and dice it in lots and lots of different ways, which means that you can look at it as a whole, like where are my biggest gaps as an organization? But I, as a sales rep, get to go in and go, all right, so I'm hitting my number, but I'm, I am the worst at this. Like, imagine if I could change that one thing, like my conversion ratio, my, my average order that, you know, we had one client who the best salesperson like ever, his average order values were just really low. He was a hard worker and he didn't think he needed anything. He was one of those ones in the room that was just like, no, nah, you know, I'm all right. So I'm, I'm doing my number. This is for everybody else. But his manager was able to say, no, in no uncertain terms, you can't hide from this now. That's the bit that you want to fix. And if you fix that, the sky's your limit. You can go further. And over the course of the next six months, his attitude, his behavior, his entire outcome and his results change significantly because of this one part of his performance that could change. Now, that is the phenomenal because you can do it from an individual, a team, a manager, a department, a region, the whole organization can all be beating to that same rhythm and can all find relevance to their viewpoint and their perspective and their lens. And that's what's really, really powerful. 
Oh, makes so much sense. Anyway, <laughs> we could talk all day, Kate. I feel like we keep you here for the next like six hours if only we could have a <laughs> podcast that long. However, I want to ask you a one question that we like to ask of some of our guests. We don't always ask it. Is there something personal or career-wise, a mistake that you made along the way that you learned from that you can tell our audience about, that you're comfortable telling our audience about, <laughs> that would help them to avoid a similar situation? So it might not be a specific experience, but it, I'm, I'm going to tell, t- God, I'm just going to reveal too, right? So yeah. I, I've got a trait in me, and I think I mentioned it earlier, I'm a positive person. Yep. And I sort of assume that everybody is, is on the same page, and I like to see the upside in things. And, and I, because of it, you know, I have failed on multiple occasions early in my career on, on sh- like things like forecasting and still, I was always the ever optimist, happy ears person building a business. I always assumed things would take less time because if I could do it this quickly, then like everything surely happens the same and it's great and we can, and it doesn't, it takes longer. So it's a lesson I learn over and over again, if I'm perfectly honest, but in, in lots of different scenarios I'm faced with that, that assuming positivity and assuming that things are good is not always the case. And you have to, again, back to my original point, compensate in other ways. Now, sometimes that's with other people in your, in your life or your business. Sometimes that's just with, with skills and experiences as you go along, knowing that you've got to temper that back would be, uh, would, would be that one for sure. And I can't remember what the other one I was going to say now that I've waffled on about that one. (laughs) So we'll just stick with the one, but yeah, that's probably that, you know, that biggest learning. And again, it's forever learning. And, and by the way, to everybody out there, learning doesn't stop. I don't care what any sales guru who thinks they've made it and has written a book about it, they should still be learning. Uh, you know, to Carlos's point, every like sales is changing every day. You know, that book you read about the stuff that you learned and you thought they were perfect, that it's changed. So I learn every single day. And that's something I definitely take. <laughs> AI. <laughs> it's all about AI. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And how to live in a world that's like that. So yeah, I that's my my final take room. What I was gonna say is what's interesting is, and I remind folks of this. If you think about top performers, whether it be in business, whether it be in sports, whether it be in music, they all seem to have a common thread. When they're at the top, they're always looking to get better, to yeah. stay better, right? To new ways of doing things. Uh, there's many top pro golfers that have made it to the top five and then changed their swing. And yeah. But it's that mindset that, like, uh, I'm good, but man, what if I could just be a little bit better? And by the way, I need to get a little bit better just to stay where I'm at. Because yeah. everyone behind me is trying to get better. And that's a mindset. And I think in business, when your mindset is, uh, hey, I've done this before. I know what I'm doing. I'm great at it. Uh, I, I know what the, cu- I literally had this one. Kraus, I know what the customer is going to say before they say it. I go, my God, they must love that from you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, so you got to figure out, you know, the people like that I think are awesome. Thanks, T. It's been wonderful having you. Thank you. I could speak to you too all day. Really good. So, perfect, Kate. If a, a listener wanted to connect with you on the topics that we've talked about today, like what's your preferred method of communication? Hit me up on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way to uh, to get hold of me. I'm generally floating around there somewhere. Perfect. <laughs> floating, floating around on LinkedIn somewhere. Okay. Somewhere. <laughs> Wherever so the fun. algorithm puts me. <laughs> mention something Kate's done. I will just encourage the audience to always mention a podcast or something that Kate's posted about so that she will take your call because yeah you need to do your research folks but thank you again for taking the time to join us today kate it's been so much fun we could go all day and really appreciate you being here thank you both it's been a pleasure likewise so all right everyone unfortunately this is the end of this episode of the b2b revenue executive experience please check us out on www.b2brevexec.com share this episode with your friends your family your dogs your cats your kids and wherever you get your podcasts please throw us a review if you can i know on itunes you can throw us a five-star review very easily i am lisa schnair i am joined by the beautiful exceptional camo wearing carlos noche (laughs) who is one of my best friends here on the podcast and honestly we wish you nothing but the greatest success You've been listening to the B2B Revenue Executive Experience. To ensure that you never miss an episode, subscribe to the show on iTunes or your favorite podcast player. Thank you so much for listening. 
Until next time.